Hello, everyone. Happy New Year, and welcome back to Streaming Alchemy. On today's show, we're going to be taking a look at Central Control 3. Central Control is a automation application that allows you to work across multiple devices, software, hardware, controllers, to basically automate your production workflow. And we're really excited about this because they've actually just added support for live to air. So this is, this is a good fit and a good timing for the show. But before we get into that, uh, I want to invite everybody, please, if you have any comments, any questions as we go through the show, please just post them in the comments and we'll try to get to everything live on air. Also, if you'd like to join us live on air, uh, please, we have a link in the show notes and here on the screen. So if you go there, somebody from the studio can get you on to join us and we can have a conversation here on air. Okay, so let me start by introducing uh, central control as a technology. What central control does is it has bindings to different pieces of software and to different controller devices. And what it's able to do is it's able to take things, applications like Live Tay or vMix, and it's able to send commands to them, and it's able to get status from them. So that's sort of one piece. But on the control side, it's also able to bind to devices like Stream Dex, or what we also have here for today's show is a Behringer X-Touch uh, universal controller. And it's able to take and do bindings to that. So different types of button pushes will be reflected as different commands to these devices. And it can also read state from these devices, metadata and state, and use that to display or change settings that are on these devices. So probably the best way to lock in on what actually this can do is to let me give you a demo. And we have this, we have this set up with live to air, but let me start by first talking about how central control would work with the stream deck. So if you look at live to air in the bottom window and you look at the bottom row of buttons we have set up, this is all programmed by central control. If I select different channels here on these buttons, that is getting reflected in live to air. So channel two, you can see that live to air is changing to that. Conversely, because central control is also reading state data from live to air, if I were to go and just click on this using my mouse, uh, you can see now that it is also pulling that state information in and making changes as I go along. So that first bottom row is really just selecting channels. The other thing you'll notice though, is that as you look across, there's a second row above this, and this row reflects all of the states that exist in the selected channel. So some of the things you'll notice is that as I move through the channels, you now have things like the name and the channel state available. So in this case, you can see here we have Brian Hedrick, He's in the off air state, but I don't have any location set. But if I actually go into live to air and set this location from New York and I save it, you'll now notice that the location data has changed here. So a very tight integration between live to air or whatever application you're using and central control. And I also have the ability for the given channel now to just change different elements of it. So I can bring a guest off air or on air. So if I click and set them on air, you can see that lights up a brighter red. And you'll also see that in the guest channel over here, uh, it is now gone on air. And you know, likewise, I can just press the button and turn it off air. I can also do things like mute the audio. So if you look down at the bottom over here, uh, I can do things to, to mute the audio to or from the guest. And so that type of functionality is baked into uh, central control and lets it talk to any application that way. Uh, 
I have some other buttons up here that I set to, to do camera control. Now, I'll talk about those in a little bit just to, to give you a, a clue for how this can work beyond just live to air. But the other piece that I wanted to do, and I'm going to sort of swing uh, the camera around, is we're going to look at what can happen on the Behringer X-Touch. So the Behringer X-Touch, pardon the camera move on screen, but the, the Behringer X-Touch is a much larger device, and it has audio settings uh, and different types of audio controls organized very much like a mixer per channel. So what I actually have set up here on the Behringer is I have the first six channels of live to air set up here. And that's just for the audio coming from the guests for each of those six channels. And then for channel seven and eight, I take whichever channel in live to air is selected and I give you the return audio to the guest and the audio from the guest. So you'll notice if I just slide this, that these channel one, since that's the selected channel, uh, is, is operating in tandem with this. So when I slide this, the two of them move together. So you, you get a sense of how all of this would work. The other piece though is I can also change which channel is selected. Again, from here, it works very similarly to what we did in the stream deck. So if I want to select a different channel, I can just press the buttons here and select. And you can see now in live to air, these channel selections are happening. But this is a much fuller control surface for things, especially things around audio. The other thing which is really, really cool in this, and let me sort of zoom in. Hopefully you'll be able to see it a little bit better. If you look up here, we're actually taking the metadata about who this guest is and the state data of the channel, and we're programming that in the scribble strip. So if I were to go here and just say, let me select channel two, you'll now see that that went to Sharon and channel three went to Nick. And so that information is now sitting there right above each one of the channels and here in these last two for the active channel. And if I were to go and bring somebody on or off air, so let me take and, and bring Nick on air, you can now see that that information is set there where I'm seeing the state of the guest inside of live to air. So if I had somebody that needed to operate audio, this would be a phenomenal way to do it. They could see each one of the guests, know their state, and have full control over all their audio sliders. And as you move between guests, uh, all this stuff is preserved. You also have all the standard audio things like mute. You know, we talked about having the ability to do mute. Uh, that's all there as well. Uh, so I can mute. Uh, and if I have a selected channel, I can mute both the return, send and return. And if you notice, everything that I'm doing over here is being reflected in the live to air UI as well. The other thing is, if I make adjustments here, so say I want to raise or lower the volume, you can see the sliders for this are moving along. So even though I'm doing controls inside of live to air on the software UI, those things are being reflected here on the hardware UI. So hopefully as, a, as an overview, this gives you a sense of the types of things you can do with a program like Central Control. And we think that's really, really slick for that having that tactile control, especially over something like live to air. And we just scratched the surface with this. We did this in you know, an afternoon to, to just sort of show what could be done but there's a lot of things in here that will be going on. So let me jump over to uh, let me jump over to some of the comments we have. Uh, so spatial optical uh, has jumped in uh, early on and, and basically said a happy new year to everybody. So spatial, thank you. We we definitely appreciate the the well wishes. Uh, and you know, as a community, I am incredibly grateful for this past year and look forward to this new year with all of you. So we also have uh, Terrell Wright is wishing everyone a happy new year. Terrell, happy new year to you as well. Uh, and Aziz, likewise, Aziz, <laughs> good to see you here and happy new year to you. We have Randall Packer. So Randall's here uh, saying uh, uh, an hello and looking forward to this. And uh, Very Scott has a more detailed comment. Uh, 
So he's saying that there's no central, uh, there's no question central control is just superb. But what about those who uh, have put all our device control eggs in the companion basket? Uh, will there be future support for companion? And the answer to that is yes, we're sort of working on now because we have had a lot of people who are in companion world. And we would expect that everything that I'm showing here would be, you know, supported there. Uh, we've just, uh, you know, we've just really focused more on uh, central control. But I agree, you know, having having both could be really useful because we know that there's a lot of workflows that are based on companion as well. So thank you for asking that. Uh, so Randall is asking, uh, he just popped in, does central control work with the current version of live to air? So the the short answer is yes. Uh, we, we're going to be putting out a new version, which will have sort of complete support, but uh, it, it does work with the current version, but the new version is coming out in you know, days. So we're talking, I would expect it out next week. So this, this, this wouldn't be any real big lag time. So, uh, and very Scott is saying, excellent, he can't wait. So good. I mean, I'm glad we're, we're hitting some of the right notes here. But so for everybody that isn't really familiar with, uh, with, these, types of, with these types of products, uh, the power of them, I think you can see from this very quick demo, is enormous. And that's, that's really important because as you build more complex workflows, having the ability to look at things across different control surfaces, across different workstations that you may have. If you have something crude where you have, you know, an audio person and somebody that's managing onboarding and somebody that's managing, you know, the switching for the guest, all of those things can now start to be integrated and coordinated, which is the biggest thing. If my audio engineer makes a change on an X touch, that change is reflected in the live to air interface. So it's not like these things will be fighting with each other. It creates a seamless connection between the different functions while still maintaining sort of this, you know, independent control points. But, you know, the, the connection is still there. And that I think is really critical. So let me jump in now and dig a bit more into the uh, central control itself and give you a, a better sense for how this this would work. So here's the central control 3.0 UI and a few really nice things on it. First, it's it's now much clearer what devices you are controlling. You can see the state of each of your control devices. They're, you can see that they're all switched on and they're all connected. So that's a, that's a, a big plus because in a production, you really just want to be able to take that scan across and go, everything I need connected is connected and very, very useful for that. The other thing is that when you actually issue commands, you can see things flash on the screen to know which devices are receiving commands or, or sharing state. So another element of this that is very, very useful for giving you that sense that I know I'm in control here, things are still good. So the way I had this set up is I had the ability when I come into central control to add devices. And a device can either be software or hardware. I'm not going to add anything new, but to give you a sense, if I click over here and say, I want to add a device here, uh, I can go down and I have all of these different devices that are supported in here. So I can just pick a device. And when I add that device, uh, you will on the right hand side of the UI, basically get the configuration you need for that device. So let's, for this example, let me just go and I'll click on live to air and it's coming back and saying, okay, what's the IP address of the system running live to air and what port does it, is it using to receive commands? So this now gives me, I can set this up with different IPs and, you know, to have the ports used. And so when I add live to air and connect it, it'll talk out to that IP and port and it will make the connection. Uh, Similarly with vMix, where you're going there and now it's like, okay, what's the port, what's the IP, and what, how often do I want to refresh what's coming from vMix? Uh, so all of these things are set up. It also has something over here for NDI camera control. 
And this is this is a new addition in uh, 3.0 that is very, very useful. I can add an NDI device and then turn around and say, what is that NDI device? And then send NDI commands to that device. And I can just go up and rename them. So I could just go in here and sort of name this anything I want and have that operate. So I could have each of my cameras set up here and go and do control of these cameras uh, collectively or individually. And that gives me like reset, uh, preset recalls, which is what I'm using here. So that it, when I set up and I went between the different for the overhead camera I have here, which is a PTZ optics camera coming NDI, the buttons that I pressed on the stream deck basically were just doing calls out to set that up as presets and to move to those presets. But the other thing it was doing, it was talking to vMix as well. So let me just start there because that's a, a very simple case. So in, in this setup, uh, if I go into vMix here, you can see I have controls and I can go in and look at any one of, uh, any one of these things as, as sort of setup controls. Uh, and everything that I want to do, because that's this frame source here, so control mapping. So actually, let me, let me jump in for another way. Let me go in actually through the Stream Deck, and we'll show, show it this way. Uh, what I have in the Stream Deck is the ability to set up buttons and what's displayed on those buttons. So in this case, because these were just, uh, I was just going there as uh, points inside, you know, buttons to press to get it to do what I needed to do, I can take each one of the buttons on the Stream Deck and assign commands to it. And when I assign those commands, what I'm actually doing is I'm saying, when I press button one, I want to have vMix go and do something. So in this case, I could have vMix do anything that, that's, that's really supported in the vMix API. So I could go and have it do transitions, do a, a, you know, any type of uh, load of, of uh, what's in preview, what's in program. And then, you know, that in that one button press, that would all happen. But I'm not limited to doing to one device. So in this case, when I was doing this to, to switch different settings on the camera overhead, I wanted to cut directly to input 27 on vMix, which was the camera overhead. And then I was saying, I want going in here to take the PTZ camera and do the NDI PTZ control to go to preset one. Uh, and so the same thing for preset one, or if I select button two, I'm going to preset two or button three, preset three. So you can see this is, this is all set up here as controls for multiple devices assigned to a single button push. So that's, that's the first thing that you can see. And you know, there are things you could do where if you wanted to you know, turn around and say, gee, if I have the Stream Deck key, I can go and you know, try to pull in a, a preset snapshot or something like that. So I could see a little video there. Th those are all possible things you could do. vMix does support that. So you could take inputs from vMix, put that in there and, and see the video that's going there right away. So very convenient things, but it's, it's basically broken up this way. So everything you do now, you can start to think of in that framework. Because I've selected in this a Stream Deck XL, there are 32 buttons, four rows of eight. And the way central control breaks these out is just as a as an enumerated list of your 32 buttons. So if you remember, we use the third and the fourth row of buttons in VMAC, in uh, on the Stream Deck to control live to air. So if I just go down and look at these Stream Deck mappings, let me go. So button uh, 25 would be should be selecting guest one, and as you can see, I can just go in here and say, what is it doing? I'm I'm going to live to air. So just sort of pop here and I can go and say, I want to select a channel, uh, which is here. And it's just going there and saying, I add the select channel command, click a plus, And I say, which channel do I want to add? And I can pick any one of the channels that are there, or I can pick the default channel, which basically whatever channel is already selected. Uh, you know, and so in this case, because I'm selecting channel and lets me pick an active channel. But if I were doing anything else, like when I want to turn around and say set on air or off air, it can say, do that with the selected channel. So let's actually look at that. 
if I wanted to go and jump into, we'll do the set on air and off here, which I think is here. Uh, there we go. So this would be my 19 and 20 are set on air and off air. So when I come here, it's saying go and on the currently selected channel, whatever that is, set it to on air. So now when you start to see these combinations, they work really well. I have buttons that let me select a channel. And then I have a bunch of function buttons that are driven off of whatever that selected channel is. And as I mentioned, this goes bi-directionally. So I know not only do I know the, uh, the functions I want to associate with the button, but I also know the states. So I mentioned before that you have things like uh, displays. So if I go down to these keys, let me see, uh, we were 18 and 19. Uh, so you can, you can look at a lot of different things on here and get those as inputs. So you have what you want to display on the input and you have what you want functionally to happen on the input. So we have those two things there and everything here really works around the same model. You have software devices that are controllable and render state and you have controlling devices that you're able to then apply that state and apply control. So the one that's probably a little more complex is the X-Touch. And so let me actually take a look at that as part of this. So you can see the X-Touch, if you, you looked at, there's a ton of buttons in the, in the X-Touch. So uh, this is like, this has record, solo, mute. So it's a lot of things that you could map to different devices and different uh, software based on you know, whatever the capabilities were. But if you look, like I have a select. So in here, I use the select button, those little green buttons under the, the top where they had the selects here. So if I go here, I am just selecting a channel. So each one of these, if you see as I walk down, it's, it's going here and saying select channel one, two, three, four. So I've just mapped all those buttons to that and they light up accordingly because they get that state information back. Uh, the other thing that we had in here is we had mute. So I think the mutes were up here. So we did the same sorts of things. Uh, so this is the audio toggle for the outputs from each of these channels. So we did that for all the mutes. And we also have, uh, you know, these were really all the buttons we use, but we also had all of the sliders mapped. And that's one of the things that's really interesting here because on this as a controller, there are a lot more elements in place. So in this case, we take and we have faders. So we have all the faders. So there are eight faders that sort of go across the base plus a main fader. So in these eight faders, we actually are setting the output level of each of the live to air channels. So if I'm sort of going here, channel one, two, three, four. So you can see this is how this was mapped. But this is incredibly simple. So all we needed to do with this X-Touch is say, here's what I want the buttons to do. And from there, everything just sort of works and it's synchronized. So very, very powerful here. And I mean, to give you a sense of this, I mean, if I come here and say what I want to do on the main fader, uh, I can turn around and say, I want to take and I want to set the channel output level and I want to do that for the current channel. So now, if I actually show you what's happening over here when I set that, this should. Uh, oh, and I just have to add this up here. So uh, then it, I believe I have this as the current channel. Okay. So now you can see as, let me sort of switch over to this here. I think I have this here. So you can see now that I just added that. It's taking whichever the selected channel is, and I now sort of reflect that state here. So that's as, as simple as it was for me to take a new slider and map it to something existing. So uh, there's a, a lot more in here, but uh, what I really wanted to make sure is that you at least get a sense of what's possible here uh, and how straightforward it is once you sort of get paradigm for how all this stuff goes together once you get that paradigm to be able to sit there and go okay all of this stuff now i can just extend my workflow automation to new devices and new software 
without actually going crazy, without having to necessarily write scripting and other code. This is a very straightforward way to do a lot of the automation things we've talked about in the past. So let me, because I know we have a more comments over here. So let me try to get to everything else that's been on here. So uh, let's see. Uh, Okay, so so I know that 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 uh, Joe and Scott were having a conversation about companion, which which is great. Uh, one of the things that Joe mentioned in that conversation, though, is that he's building an API for another feature uh, in uh, Central Control, which is a teleprompter. <laughs> so it's something I I haven't really uh, shown at, here at all, but I will in a in a future show. But this teleprompter allows you to use a Google Doc, scroll up like a regular teleprompter, and associate different trigger commands uh, at different points in your script, even doing things like pausing the script and then restarting it after something happens. So if you wanted, for instance, in to go and play a video in vMix, you could have the teleprompter run, play tell, at a certain point, tell it to play the video in vMix and pause the teleprompter, and when that video ends, that can send a trigger back to the teleprompter to go and resume. So different things like that where you have an incredible amount of control capability, but also this sort of workflow integration where you have a lot of talent that may be doing things on a teleprompter. And having the, the commands trigger automatically based on whatever speed they're reading can be really, really powerful. So just a, a point I wanted to make. Uh, so let's see, uh, what else do we have? So let's see, we have Biz Shorty. Uh, he says, hey, peeps, I am here. <laughs> so Biz, uh, very good, thank you. Uh, it is great to see you. Uh, so we have Vita De Broadcast. He says, uh, he's saying, I, he thinks it's, it's wrong, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to work with, to, to say people are, are stuck in companion. I, I think, yeah, I mean, that's, I think there's a, a, a certain levity to, to that comment. Yeah, I think everybody, uh, you know, everybody has different th areas that they're comfortable in. And so uh, I think the key thing here, though, is that all of these things can, can work together. So we're not really, uh, as we look at things, you could have different people using different technology and even use different technologies within the same production based on the capabilities of each. So a lot of, a lot of interesting pieces here. Uh, so Randall Packard, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to go through. Uh, so, okay, we have JP Nordet. JP is, is saying hello to everybody. Uh, and uh, let's see, I'm trying to do things so I'm not going through everybody's conversation. Uh, so John Drinkwater is saying uh, basically anything is possible. Uh, so th the quick answer is yes. And the way uh, central control works or, or, or companion for that matter in the, in the same way is that you need to get support for different software and devices inside of uh, like central control. And as you can see, there was a, when I showed that list, there's a long list of uh, controls that were, were, were devices that could be controlled uh, inside of that. So anything that's supported within that uh, that list of devices, you can then pretty much do anything. You know, there's, you know, for the most part, everything that was in the these devices is is exposed. And if there's an API and there's state, that information can all be integrated into central control, uh, and that would be something that you'd be able to control. So, yes. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so Randall is asking if I have a hyperdeck that I can demonstrate. Uh, I don't have it set up here. Uh, we do have uh, a previous generation hyperdeck, and I, I agree. I think that you know, if I do a more detailed dive into some of the other features in Central Control, I will definitely you know include that in it because I think it's it's pretty cool as a as a capability. And again. You know, because we showed the X Touch as a controller. This as a controller can end up controlling multiple devices. So I could have records on here controlling a hyperdeck, but I could have the mutes and the sliders controlling live to air. 
and I could have other functions that are set up controlling triggers in vMix. So you could have all these things happening together from a single control surface or multiple control surfaces. So definitely uh, pretty cool stuff. And it's, it's, it's a workflow mindset with a lot of these things. Uh, let's see. Uh, so John Drinkwater just said something interesting. Uh, there, he said there's, there's a lot of growth in the flight sim community. And they're looking uh, at control devices to have more re realism. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this, you know, if there were, were, were specific controllers that you were interested in, some of these things could be really, really interesting. Uh, so let's see. So Spatial Optical, uh, Spatial Optic is saying, life has been glorious with the Genovation Control Pad 24 and the Stream Deck uh, 15 M.2. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Spatial has been talking about, you know, a lot of the stuff that he's been working with for automation. And I agree. I mean, when you combine the, the native integration with some of these devices, like, you know, the ability to trigger shortcuts in vMix with a Stream Deck, but compare that to things like Central Control, where you can spread those controls easily with a single button push across multiple devices, that's, that's another level of automation power that you have. And, you know, we, we think of these things a lot where if I were to do something in live to air, like bring a guest on air, that could also be part of a trigger for something I'm doing in vMix where I may turn around, want to bring a guest on air, switch to an input in vMix and then unmute the guest. So things like that, where you could do all that with a single button push without any scripting. Very, very powerful there. And, uh, so uh, Spatial Optics also saying that he has uh, the Roadcaster Pro 2 finally working with vMix. Uh, yeah, I, I need to, to see if I can get my hands on that because that, that is really an exciting, uh, exciting device. It, it, it's, you know, part controller, part, uh, you know, sort of mixer. And I just think it, it really integrates with so many different things out there that it, it could be really, really powerful. So, all right. So as I mentioned, this is going to be our last show for season three. Uh, we will be starting up our new season probably in about eight weeks. Uh, and the reason behind that is we have a lot of work to do <laughs> to, to get prepped for the new season. Uh, so that's something I'll talk a little bit about in the post show. But I just want to let everybody know, so even though we won't be doing the live shows, there are video topics that we want to cover uh, that we mentioned, but sort of just don't lend themselves well to a live show because of the sort of complexity of setup. But that's stuff that we will be doing over this eight week, I'll call it a hiatus, but it's really a eight, pre, eight, eight week compressed post pre-production schedule for season four. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, we will definitely uh, be, be doing to, to keep everybody connected. And, you know, definitely we want to, uh, you know, we want to continue our conversation going even when we're not doing, you know, live shows. So we'll be trying to stay connected through all the channels, you know, the Facebook group and things we post on YouTube. So uh, with that said, uh, what I'll probably do now is I'll end this show and we'll jump into the, the post show and we'll just carry on the conversation because Joe uh, DeMax, who is the sort of the author of Central Control 3, because he's here in, in the conversation, uh, this, if you have any questions or want more detail, this would be, this would be the time to sort of jump in and, uh, and ask those questions. So, Will, we'll do that in a moment. So... Until then, have a very safe and a very happy start to your new year. Uh, we will be live again with everybody in March again. And uh, until then, be well, be safe. I'll see you in the post show. Take care, everyone. Welcome back everyone to our post-show hangout. So uh, thank you for, you know, I know there's a lot of things that uh, people have been asking and 
if you sort of read through the comments, I could, because a lot of these are direct conversations uh, that are uh, are basically things that people have been asking uh, and Joe has been trying to respond. So uh, let's see. I, I do not know if uh, we're using OSC uh, at, at, with central control. So that's something that, that Joe would have to, to answer. So let's see. So it, yeah, it depends on the device. So yeah, so Randall just asked something. He's asking where we're pulling the sample clips from for, for live to air. So uh, everything that we're, we're showing with, with sample clips when we do this is we, we have uh, story blocks, which we have a subscription to. And what we do is we, we pull these sort of headshot videos and we take them into uh, DaVinci Resolve, cut them, flip it on the second half so we have a, a, a smooth loop and we just play those back as loops. So that's how we're, that's how we're doing that for, for those types of things, which, which can be good when you, when you want to do things that are, are demo-based. And that's, that's what we use these for. Uh, uh, so let's see. Uh, so let's see. Very Scott. So, John, will you be announcing pricing soon for call-in one? I think that's what they call it. Yes. No. So uh, we we happy to announce it. It is right now call-in one is going to be a, an annual subscription for $99. But if you buy any one of Live to Air 6 or Live to Air 12, that will be included in addition for free. So you'll you'll be able to use all the call in one features along with your Live to Air, or it'll just be an annual subscription, $99 for uh, the call in one. So I'll say so Randall uh, is saying, what is what is Storyblocks? So Storyblocks is a uh, a media site. So if you go to Storyblocks.com, they have a uh, a subscription. It's it's like three hundred dollars or something a year. Uh, and what it will let you do is you can download video, you can download image files. It has, I believe, After Effects templates there as well. So, you know, a fairly broad selection of meteor assets. And uh, we basically think it's really great bang for the buck. Uh, it doesn't have every type of asset that you may want. And we sort of use uh, stock uh, images from Adobe for things that we can't get Storyblocks. But we think uh, Storyblocks is an excellent uh, media source if you, if you need assets. So storyblocks.com and they have their, their own subscription. So let's see. Uh, so, so Biz Short, he's saying he, uh, he needs calling one uh, uh, so bad. So yeah, if, if you haven't gotten the alpha yet, uh, Biz, that's something we're, we're trying to, to catch up and get out to, to everybody that's asked for that. So uh, you, should, you should have it, it soon to, to start to test with. And let's see. So the other thing, by the way, which uh, somebody asked in last no, two weeks ago show where we, we, we introduce call in one they asked if that would have uh the metadata and the answer is yes i i i sort of equivocated because i wasn't sure whether it's in it yet but it's actually in there now so if you want to use call in uh call in one you can actually pull metadata out of that and use that in vmix to do lower thirds and other stuff so that that's also there so oh so randall's question was actually how you are getting the clips into live tear so all right uh I'm actually taking them in as guests. So I have, I'm using OBS to play these loops. I'm sending each one out its own scene through NDI. And I'm using the NDI virtual webcam to pull in those individual NDI feeds. And from there, I'm just putting those into a browser and connecting them normally into live to air. So we are using live to air natively. The only difference is we're pulling in a video as the webcam on the guest side. So what you see here is true live to air performance integration. There's nothing faked here. It's just instead of webcams, we're using virtual webcams with video loops. But that's all through OBS, playing loop videos in different scenes and pulling them into virtual webcams. So... Uh, Let's see. So 
Biz Shorty was saying he's, he, he swears it was designed, uh, that uh, colon one was designed for him. So, uh, yep, we, uh, we thank you for saying that. We definitely appreciate that. And uh, I, I just, since we've been talking about central control uh, today, one of the things I, I will make is that the automation control isn't there in colon one. Uh, we don't have automation, you know, for, for that that piece yet, but it is in the light air piece, which is obviously a, a more complex application with a lot more uh, things going on. So, you know, just to, I wanted to be clear of that, but uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, that's something that, again, the first quarter this year, it will be out there. So uh, I know there are a lot of questions back and forth with Joe. So I just want to make sure that uh, if there's anything else that hasn't been answered here, that uh, we, we get to that. Oh, okay. So Vita the Broadcast is asking, what will next season be about? So there's a, there's a few things that we wanted to do. So we've had a lot more interest from people in the TriCaster community. So one of the things that we want to do is in addition to continuing doing things we've been doing with vMix, we also want to introduce more things around the TriCaster and hopefully show how it can work in both domains. Cause I think a lot of things that we talk about are doable, you know, across different platforms. The other piece though, uh, that we really want to emphasize in season four will be sort of beginning to end production workflows. And a big piece of that is going to be doing shows across multiple blocks. So for instance, uh, we can turn around and say, how would you create a virtual event as a production? So that's going to involve lots of different steps, everything from, you know, stuff we would talk about with live to air, obviously things that you would talk about in TriCaster or vMix universe for bringing those in, building those sessions, the graphics that would go with that any automation that you'd want to add for that, you know, automation with metadata, automation with different flows on the screen, all the things that may be coming in with, with data that you want to bring, bring into the show and present. So building all those graphics, and then how would you actually sort of execute on that as a complete end-to-end -end production? How would you crew it? How would you, you operate it? So what season four will be more about is sort of these whole pictures of things. So we, we've looked at virtual events or something. We look at potentially like a game show. How would you produce a game show and do that? But soup to nuts, how, how you do from, I'm starting with a blank slate all the way to, I'm ready to, to go live on my production day. So that's, that's a big piece of it. But we are still gonna be doing individual shows about different specific capabilities. You know, of course, vMix, different automation techniques, things like Node.js, uh, Visual Basic, all the things that we sort of covered in the past. So one of the things that I'd actually like to ask everybody uh, as we go through sort of the, the next few weeks is if there are specific things you would like us to cover, uh, we can either try to integrate them as part of these block shows where, where we cover bigger workflow pictures, but we can also do them as individual shows. So definitely something that you know, we would be very interested in, in covering here. And, you know, we've been reaching out to, to other vendors to see how we could do things to show, you know, some of the capabilities and products that are out there. So I know we've been, uh, we've been working with, uh, you know, PTZ Optics and, you know, we've had a, a chance to show off different things that you can do with some of their gear. Uh, we, just started talking with the folks at New Blue, uh, where they, they, they have Tidler and Tidler Live. So we think some of the things they're doing with graphics are phenomenal. So we definitely would like to show, you know, some of those things off. Because again, we really want to introduce people to different technical capabilities that are out there. Uh, you know, not all of them are free, obviously, you know, but what we really want to make sure is that you know they're there. And when you have productions that could justify integrating some of these uh, tools that you have a sense of what they can do and what would be the right tool. So these are all the things we really want to sort of figure out as we go through uh, the next season. So hopefully, uh, you know, with your input, the season will focus 
on exactly the types of things you're looking to do here. So let's see. Uh, is there anything, any other questions that have, have come up here? So, so let's see. Okay, so let's see. So uh, how about a group chat to uh, on live to air uh, in post show with those of us testing colon one? Yeah, I, I, that would be something uh, I would definitely be interested in. And, you know, one of the other things, so all of these things require uh, certain prep on our side, but, you know, certainly one of the things that we, we could do is we could make the post show uh, sort of open up call and manager and ha uh, l open up live to air and have multiple people join and have these types of discussions uh, as well face to face. So there are things that we could, could certainly do with that. And in the post show, that may make it easier where people, you know, do not feel that they're the, the focus of attention, but we could have sort of group conversations about different things and, and go back and forth, feedback, questions, everything. Because as, as I think you've seen here, we're, we're very open to the feedback from people for what we do. And I'm also very open to say if I don't know something, so I've learned a lot from the people in this group. So that JP, I think that's a, that's a, that's definitely a uh, a good idea there. So let's see what we can do as we go into uh, the next season. But also that may be something I want to do. Uh, I want to do generally speaking for everybody in that uh, call and one community. So we may set that up as well. So let me let me follow up with you on that. So we have uh, Joe Demax saying Visual Basic, my favorite. Uh, Visual Basic is one of those like love hate relationships, uh, and I think let me let me clarify that because I think it's important. One of the big things is that inside of VMix, when you do VMix scripting with Visual Basic, you can't break things into functions because it's sort of where the Visual Basic stack is sitting inside of VMix as an application. So it means that a lot of code gets sort of munged together. Uh, without real functions in place. And that, uh, th that just makes it hard to maintain. Very, very powerful, the fact you can just do these types of things inside of a single app, but makes it hard to maintain. That's why, uh, you know, despite the, uh, everything that, uh, you know, Joe's, Joe's endorsement for Visual Basic, uh, <laughs> that's why we, we've been looking at uh, things like Node.js, because that allows you to take a separate system and create, functions and libraries and other stuff. So you can start to treat this like you would all your other production assets. These become things that I can, you know, basically insert into a production and write specific code that ties these together without having to rewrite functionality over and over again if I need to tweak it or do little different things with it. So that's, that's really the, the, but any good programming language well used gives you a lot. So. Uh, we have Vita, uh, the broadcast is asking it. If I can ask something on this theme, not only talk about the big picture, but how each part of the job can be done by a third party because you can't or because your client may request. So, yeah, I, I definitely understand the, uh, the nuance there. So this is something that I think we will, we will sort of focus on. Some of this, uh, some of this can be done, and we, we're talking about the best way to really show this off in the next season. But having certain functionality that can run cloud-based, where you can have distributed crews, and these crews can be, you know, third parties that don't necessarily have to be there. That's one thing that we we're looking at, uh, and we may do that not in live uh, shows, but things we pre-record. Because some of that, when you're doing it live and you're trying to run a production at the same time as you're going outside and you know controlling uh, components in AWS, some of that could just be a little difficult for us to do in the way we have our our show, you know, fleshed out here. But definitely, uh, I understand what you're asking for, and I mean that's part of the reason I, I I talked here about you know central control or as a you know any any of the sort of automation applications is that they do let you segment different functionalities. So just with what we showed here, you could have somebody that's doing sort of an A1, you know, the audio engineer has something like an X-Touch and a, you know, Yamaha QL mixer and be doing, 
live mics and remote guest sort of as a single A1 station here. Oops, knock my drink over here uh, as a single A1 station. So, you know, things like that now where you can segment, uh, you know, functions inside of a production crew. So definitely see that. And hopefully, you know, again, these are things that there are lots of different ways to do it. So we'll try to show, you know, sort of different levels as we go through this. So thank you for that. That's a that's a, a, an important point because I, I recognize the things you have there. So he said, his reality is 100% of the time I'm doing part of it. Sometimes I'm planning. Sometimes I'm planning and executing. Sometimes I'm executing just the part of it. So I, I totally get that. So I think... The key thing here is we look at this and, and what we want to cover is, is definitely that planning stage because I think that's, that's critical. Even if, even if in a production you're going to execute a part of it, I think the most effective crews are the ones who understand the entire workflow. And sort of that plan uh, for how it all comes together is very visible because then everybody in a crew – sees themselves as part of a pipeline with an understanding of what comes before and what comes after sort of their function. And I think the other reality in, in almost everything that's, that's a live production is that things go wrong. <laughs> and having the ability to sort of know how to diagnose what's wrong. You know, my I hearing a, a buzz in the audio or something is is i'm trying to switch to a camera and it's not switching why all of these types of things if you have an appreciation of sort of the whole pipeline and what is what is controlling what and what is feeding what and what's getting feeds uh you you can end up doing those things much more effectively and you can ask the right questions of the right people so if you're if you're sort of in the director role and you're running the production the, the ability to go and say, I need you to look and figure out what's going on here. And then you can go and focus on everything else and know that there's a single point of control and ownership. And that sort of ownership roles becomes important as well. So th thank you for sharing that because I, I think it, it isn't shared enough. People don't necessarily see that, uh, that reality and, and how these come together. Uh, so very Scott is saying... Uh, You'd love some new blue title of five live. So, yeah, so this is something that, uh, you know, we would actually love because a lot of things that we've done in live to air have a lot of metadata associated with it. And that's really, you know, one of the things that started our conversation with them is how could we create things that are more template driven around all the assets we have in live to air? And they just have some incredible stuff in there. I mean, they, we we were attracted to their product before we thought about using them with with live tear, but it, definitely they're they're doing some real cutting edge stuff on the graphics. And I don't know whether you've seen it, but they they actually have the ability to embed After Effects templates, you know, with some specific things you you should be looking at, but to embed After Effects templates into Titler to to create very sophisticated rendered. Uh, graphics and things. So very excited to dig deeper because I'm just starting my learning journey there as well, but definitely cool. Uh, so Biz Shorty saying he would definitely like to learn more about Title Alive as well. So uh, good. That's uh, that's definitely something then that uh, we want to make sure we, we get into all of this. Uh, so JP is saying we'll be setting up licensed partner distribution. Uh, so Right now, because that's a, that's a fair question. Right now, we can do distribution uh, of our product within sort of North America, Australia, and New Zealand. So we have Canada, US, Mexico, Australia, and New Zealand. And that was really because of logistics for us. Servicing everybody in uh, Europe and Asia, it just became very difficult. And we couldn't really sell hardware outside the US. So we actually have a, a, a partner in Australia and New Zealand that services, you know, a dealer partner that services those two markets. Uh, and we work with multiple people in the US for, you know, US, Mexico and Canada, because the sort of the, the free trade region there makes that sort of uh, business possible. We work with a partner 
uh, multicam systems outside of those those regions, and they currently have an exclusive for Duin distribution. So that's only true though about hardware. On the software side, uh, if anybody wants to buy software, uh, you know we can sell that software anywhere globally because you know there are no encumbrances on that type of distribution. So that's sort of sort of the downloaded software. So uh, hopefully that gives you sort of a clue of uh, how we how we are working with this right now. But you know we're always looking for better ways to do things, ways that you know not just work for us logistically, but also work for our customers and you know for for people that would like to to be working with us. So feedback on all of that always welcome. I probably would do that if you you need to reach out. Uh, reach out to us at uh, you know support at neural g n u r e l dot com and we can uh, we can discuss that you know sort of not in an open forum I think it's you know I want to make sure that everybody feels that they're getting heard and I understand everybody's concerns so we'll we'll make sure we uh, we we can follow up on this but thank you J P so uh, Randall saying uh, and John one last question can you ingest the audio bandwidth in the new version of live to air. So currently, uh, there's no there's no direct uh, audio bandwidth adjustment. I mean, because a lot of that stuff is happening inside of uh, the WebRTC stack. So you're, you know, we're basically going for the most part with H.264 for video. Uh, and we're, you know, using, uh, I forget the uh, the, the, the protocol name uh, inside. Uh, so what was it? So Opus, it was Opus. So we're, we're using Opus as the codec for, for audio. So we do though, in the new version, uh, have the ability to uh, sort of control the different things that the browser can clamp on. So. I don't have it set up over here to show you, but uh, this this would let you you do things where you can turn off echo cancellation and basically voice optimization, things like that. Uh, so that will give you a cleaner signal. So if you really wanted to do audio of high quality, that would pass the best quality audio possible from that guest over the bandwidth they have. So sorry if that's not an exact... Uh, you know, uh, response you wanted to see, but this is definitely, uh, you know, it will give you a lot more control and a lot higher quality audio in the situations where, you know, you can leverage that. So let's see, what else do we have here? So Spatial is saying uh, he started out in Visual Basic back in 1989 uh, and he moved over to C Sharp in 2007 and haven't turned back. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the different programming frameworks are, are, you know, they're they're getting better and better. But I mean, I'll I'll tell you. I mean, I saw some stuff going on which I, I have to try out. There's there's people that are using Chat GPT, which I, I don't know whether you've seen that. That's an an AI a conversational AI tool that will you can ask questions. People have been asking it to write vmix scripts for them. <laughs> this comes back with scripts, so I actually have to see how well that is because. Uh, you know, we may all uh, we may all find our jobs are drastically different in the future, and uh, I may just become a chatbot at some point, and streaming alchemy will be taken over by AI. So, who knows? Who knows what we'll have? But uh, yeah, I think C Sharp is is definitely a a very uh, solid tool, and we do we do a lot of our development for everything in Lightair is either C Sharp or C plus plus based on the the level and the stack that we're working with. But definitely uh, really good stuff. So, uh, so Joe is, uh, is saying he wrote a vmix script the other day and, and had to use the titles text as a global variable. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, there's a uh, there's there's a a lot of a lot of things uh, that you get used to with scope and other stuff when you do programming languages, and the more modern languages sort of take care of a lot of this for you, uh, and so you don't have you don't have the same chance of making mistakes, uh, forgetting to clean stuff up, not freeing memory. So, I mean, it's still possible to, you know, bash things up, but it, it makes it a 
it gives you more uh, confidence that what you put out, you know, all the garbage collection and other things that need to happen are taking place for you. So let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, so automation for vMix, hello. Thank you for joining us here and happy new year. So uh, this is uh, this is definitely a, a, a nice conversation that we're, that we're having. So uh, let's see. Uh, so JP is saying, uh, if there is any lang oh sorry uh, just a note to those of you testing call in one remind uh, your guests to turn their devices to 169 on mobile tell them to unlock screen and turn it sideways yeah so uh that's uh that's stuff that uh, we're we're definitely trying to make sure we've we've covered all the different angles with that but uh thank you jp that's that's definitely uh worthwhile uh as a as a point and i i think agree this is sort of to your point of having everybody talk to each other in the, uh, in the beta test or, you know, for, for call one. So let me see what, what I can do to set that up. Uh, good point on that. So let's see what else. So, uh, JP was asking, can you use call in one on the same PC as vMix when live, uh, or must it go via NDI on a separate PC? No, you can, you can use them on the same PC. Uh, to be honest, for what we do on the show, because I can't have too many different systems running and, and sort of manage it, uh, we actually have one monster sort of Threadripper PC here. So it's like a, a 32 core system that we run vMix, we run live to air, uh, you know, we run call in manager. So we have a lot of stuff all running. They all work together. Uh, NDI will know if it's a local route or, or, or a network route and the connection would happen fine. So no issues with that. And it can go over NDI then, but it'd be very efficient. So you're, you're not going to have the same sort of network load because it will just all be local. So that's uh, uh, a good point on that. All right. What else do we have here? Uh, so so uh, Spatial is saying... But I'm screwed if I cannot use C sharp. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, I, I think by and large, C sharp has has evolved to, to really cover, you know, most most requirements, even even lower level. And a lot of things for us is, I mean, we started developing live to air over 10 years ago, so. There's a lot of things that even though probably every bit of code in the system has been totally rewritten, it's been rewritten over time sort of using you know, similar technologies. But uh, we are constantly doing updates to this. So you know, we will probably find that a smaller subset of what we use inside our own code base is C++ and most of it will be going to, to C sharp. But just as a i'm throwing it out there there are a lot of new languages that have sort of been developed over the past 10 years uh some of them with very custom you know focuses uh google has been doing uh, a lot in this space but i know there are there are other open source projects so just sort of look around at some of the other new languages because for some of the things you may want to do they they may be a better choice than the sort of traditional standards that uh, we've all been using for the past forever. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, so we have Joe's vote for C-sharp is the best. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think for where we are right now, it, it, it covers the most territory uh, with the least amount of pain. So I probably, certainly for what we do, uh, I would agree with Joe on that. So let's see. Uh, is there any language other than English? I'm lost. <laughs> Everything must be plug and play and DIY. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I think the uh, it's funny because for a lot of things, uh, you know, when people think of technology, uh, we, you know, we're very comfortable talking about things as languages that we talk to machines with. But what we're certainly seeing with a lot of the AI is that English maybe, or your native language, whatever that may be, 
may become more and more the generic language that you program in, uh, where the actual technical logic behind things uh, will just be hidden. You know, to the same extent that you know you get in a car, you're not you're not thinking about a lot of the things that are actually going on. You just have a few basic controls that you can do. And now we're even taking some of those away with self-driving. So, you, you know, you, you sort of look at how these things have progressed. Within 10 years, I think we will be looking at programming as a very different discipline. And, you know, there will be parts of it that, you know, will clearly require that in-depth technical understanding. But I think a lot of other pieces of it will be really stitching together logic in ways that apply to specific situations. So almost like I have a set of functions and then I just need to write that main loop that calls them and asks them to do things in certain orders. So you may find that uh, uh, your, your statement here is not far off in the future. So that could be, uh, that would be a lot of fun to see. All right, so uh, Vita is saying the crazy thing uh, is that you can post the error and it will try to fix it. Yeah, so it is. I mean, ChatGPT is is is, is what I think uh, Vita is talking about. That yeah, it it's very interesting for something that's really nascent. You know, it's 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 just in its early stages here, uh, and the reason it's sort of out for everybody is just trying to learn more. So as more and more feedback uh, as it gets more and more feedback and more and more cases of people asking to do stuff it's going to become better and better and you know this is something you know to, from sort of the geeky side everybody used to call this a tipping point in a technical curve is where you reach enough of a critical mass that development which has sort of been this slow linear progression turns into what they call the hockey stick it just turns and goes straight up. So I think we're going to see this with a lot of these technologies where you'll move forward and we'll see these things incrementally over, you know, the next five, six, seven years. But then year eight, suddenly it turns around. It's like, wow, <laughs> you know, everything is just exploded. Now I'm asking it complex things, philosophical things, very creative things. And it's coming back with amazingly good responses. So that's what I expect uh, to happen here. And yeah, this is, uh, you know, a lot of these things, you know, where you can watch what these have done in the past and what they're doing today and just sort of extrapolate that and then ramp it up at some point because that's that's probably what we're going to see here. But uh, yeah, so uh, let's see. Do we have any other questions coming in? So yeah, so Joe said he, he watched that video. Yeah, I mean... Some of this stuff it it will floor you. So so uh, we we all need to we all need to think about this, and it will impact a lot of us. But where some of this stuff can be very useful in the near term can be around certain things like I need a, I need a script that talks about something as an intro paragraph for a video segment I'm doing. You can throw that out there and get a, a sort of a good first draft of something with domain knowledge that sort of focuses on some key points. And then you could just sort of rework that into something that makes sense for you. But it's almost like taking collective Google searches that you would do where you're sort of researching something, but just having that combined into a single summation paragraph, sort of tailored in the way you were looking to, to see it. But uh, it's going to be uh, it's it, it's going to be interesting to see. So JP uh, is saying, not sure what we're going to do on Friday nights for the next few weeks, uh, while we wait for the next season. So, yeah, I I I am sorry. You know, I I have to say this is my uh, my son works here. You know, he's as as one of uh, our 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 programmers here for for all the technical stuff. But he said that. Uh, when COVID came and everybody was isolating, people were just catching up with what he did for the last whole, whole grown up part of his life. So, so there's, there, there's sort of a certain amount of that when you, when you're a geek, it, 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 you can be comfortable not, not going out and doing a lot of other stuff. So uh, if you want to take this for, you know, everybody that, that, that shares sort of that, that general geek philosophy, uh, you know, you might want to take this for a chance to, to, 
to to explore Netflix or or something something else that you haven't you know had a chance to catch up on. But uh, yeah, no, I uh, I appreciate that, JP. It, it 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 it's funny how you know we're gonna actually miss doing this as well. So you know, having this conversation every week is something we really look forward to. But the number of things that we need to do to get ready for next season is is fairly significant and trying to do that at the same time as doing these weekly shows would just really be uh really be too much in addition to running a, a company so uh that's why but but thank you for that i i, I really appreciate it and, and no it it goes both ways so i i love this community and everything we, we have here together so last so the last thing uh what JP is saying is, uh, how about using call in one or live to air to bring in remote cameras? So essentially, because uh, Randall was asking before how we do these these loops inside of uh, live to air. And the way we're doing that is we're using a virtual webcam, uh, taking an NDI feed coming in. So if I wanted to, I could really do the same thing with a remote camera. So I could just take an NDI camera, bring that in, and, and, and use that as a remote feed, and then you know handle that as, as an input. Uh, some of the things that you'd need to work out if it's like a PTZ, we currently, you know, because of sort of the network, you know, the internet as a network between us, we don't have a way to, to sort of send those commands directly. But it's something we're actually looking at potentially in the future to have some way to, you know, tunnel commands uh, for things like PTZ control, NDI control to a remote camera, and that would make it more of a complete framework. Uh, but yeah, that it's definitely something that that you could do. And to be honest, I mean, the way we're doing this is with we're doing this with OBS. So I could take any of the outputs for OBS and I could switch it. So I, I could effectively not just have a remote camera, but I could have a remote switch take place that is feeding a studio. So you wanted somebody to go to a satellite station and sort of pull things together and pull that in. That, that would definitely be possible without a lot of, uh, uh, of, of setup. I mean, SRT is, is another technology that sort of fits in that space for remote camera ingest or remote feed ingest from a location. But uh, again, you know, the nicest thing about, and I'll be honest, about live to air as, as technology is it doesn't need a lot of pre-configuration. I don't need to open, you know, ports and everything in your typical environment. So it, it lets you do a lot of stuff with that. But uh, yeah, so definitely uh, multiple possibilities for doing that. All right, so uh, I guess we're probably at a wrap point here. Uh, I have to tell you, it's really hard for me to let go of the show because I know I'm not going to get to spend this time with you again for the next uh, you know, month and a bit. But uh, definitely know how much I appreciate all the support we've gotten this past year. Uh, I do want to encourage everybody, if uh, you have suggestions for specific topics, for general arcs of things you'd like us to cover in Season 4, just get them into us. It would be something that... Uh, we really want to try and make sure we cover as much of the things that all of you would like to see uh, a, as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, just as a, you know, as a reference point for the things that we want to do, we are not going all one direction, you know. So we will have, you know, traditional shows that we had, single topic. VMix will integrate some more things around TriCast, but the same sort of single topic how-to types of shows, as well as these bigger shows. So there's a lot of places to fit uh, the different things in that all of you may want us to talk about. So definitely uh, keep those keep those suggestions coming. We appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, the other thing that uh, Vita just, just threw out, you know, sort of following up on, on what JP has here, is just that uh, WebRTC does have lower latency, uh, and, you know, if you're doing have that back and forth conversation, that can be really useful. So, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's another thing. And I agree that's it can simplify some of the things you want to do. Uh, but, uh, yep. So thank you for, for adding that. So 
please, everyone, be safe, uh, be well, and we will see you in a little bit with season four. Thank you again. Take care.